the return of Hong Kong to China just means that China has found itself and that the humiliation is ending. Mr. Tung, I would like to ask you about the situation in Hong Kong today, the reasons behind that, and also the future of Hong Kong. But can we talk first about the history, where that comes in? What is Hong Kong and some of the events that may have shaped its current status today? Actually, it was way back some 2,000 years, Hong Kong was already part of China. In those days, it was the Qing Dynasty. In the 1800s, there were several war between United Kingdom and China. It's known as the Opium War. So 176 years ago, this area was ceded to the British as a colony. This is really the, the history and to many Chinese this is not just ceding of the territory but also it's a war about opium. At the end of the Second World War and as the Chinese People's Republic was formally established, the government announced that, that all those territories taken away by others uh, through war effort or other means uh, needs to be returned to China. And this, of course, applies to Hong Kong. It was in the early 80s when Britain and China began to negotiate on the return of Hong Kong to China. Negotiation started between the two countries in 1982 and ended in 1984. Most of the time it was done in Hong Kong, right in this building where we're having this interview. What happened next? Because there was created one country, two systems. What is one country, two systems? Mr. Deng Xiaoping, at that time he was the leader of China felt that uh, it is entirely possible there are people in Hong Kong who will not feel comfortable to have Hong Kong return to China because it would be a different system. Uh, one is more of a capitalist system in Hong Kong and the other in China is a socialist system. He suggested that because of that, quite ingeniously, what about let's go for well, one country having two systems to accommodate this uh, situation. You can keep your lifestyle, your economy, your systems for a period of time so that you can get used to it. When you get to use it, and China in the meantime is changing, changing in a way that may be more acceptable. Why? Because after all, Hong Kong separated from China for 156 years. Uh, and the, there are people in Hong Kong who may really cannot adjust to these changes so quickly. So for that, he said, I think we can do something very new, which is to make Hong Kong a part of China, but under one country, two systems. Did he do this on his own, or did he ask the people? China and people of Hong Kong started a discussion to see how one country, two system can work in Hong Kong. 
officials from the mainland, the leaders from the Hong Kong society. We were working together. Each one had 100 member delegates. And this went on for four years and eight months. It took some time. When this was completed, it was put to the National People's Congress. It became a basic law. And this basic law, with the one country, two system characteristic, becomes the constitutional framework for Hong Kong. And I have to tell you, over the last 20 years, basic law has been very good for Hong Kong. In every respect, we, we got it right. I remember on July 1st, 1997, being at home, watching you on television as this huge event happened. What do you think was the underlying significance of 1997? Was it simply about the return of Hong Kong to China? No, no, it was not that. But to the hundreds and millions of Chinese people all around the world, and or I should say over a billion uh, point four people in China, the return of Hong Kong to China just means that China has found itself and that the humiliation is ending. Yes, we got back the territory, but it is the humiliation of China to be defeated in an opium war and to have to concede, even though it's tiny, tiny territory to another country. I think the humiliation ended on July 1st, midnight. And I, I was very honored to be, to be right in the middle of that. <laughs>